thought my task was pretty easy. I was going to say there's not going to be any surgery in the future in, in, in surgical oncology, but perhaps not so fast. Because technology is going to play a major role in the future of surgery, particularly in the field of surgical oncology. Technology will help surgeons plan their surgery ahead of time. They're actually going to have surgeons practice and rehearse with the use of virtual reality the actual surgery being performed the day before or hours before the actual operation. So when they go into surgery, they know exactly where they're going to find interoperatively. And finally, with the use of fluorescence technology, as you can see here, the surgeons will know exactly what they have to remove and exactly what they don't have to remove interoperatively, which is often a very challenging question being raised during surgery. As you can see, technology will play a major role, and technology can do great things. Technology does great things when you have critical thinking behind it. The problem is when you don't have critical thinking behind it, and then technology may become actually rubbish. So the real challenge for the future surgeon is to use technology and critical thinking behind it to actually choose the exact procedure for each individual patient. Now I'll take you in an example. I'm, I'm a colorectal surgeon. I'm obviously going to show you a rectal cancer. As you can see here, this is a T2 and not um, rectal cancer. And there's various alternatives to this. We could do a local excision alone. No pre-op, no post-op treatment. This is pretty good. Technology can help you. We could do chemoradiation therapy and then local excision of the residual lesion, as you can see here. Or we can go and do standard total mesorectal excision. And this can be done with different technological toys. We can do with the laparoscopic toy or even the robotic more modern toy. And this is very cool. However, so far, we have failed to demonstrate any real benefit of any of these toys in terms of oncological benefits. We could also perform extended lateral node dissections, such as the Japanese um, proposed for rectal cancer. We don't really know which patients need this type of operation still. And finally, obviously, we could do chemoradiation therapy to this particular patient and have a complete clinical response and not operate at all. And this is probably going to be at the surgeon's decision. So the real challenge here is how to choose with the aid of technology. And when I say technology, to hit the bullseye. When you come to a meeting like this, you see a lot of molecular biology involved into the decision-making process of medical oncology. When you look into surgical decision-making, there's absolutely almost nothing in terms of molecular biology. But I think that the future surgeon will look like a bit like this, because he will know what's going to happen to this particular patient with a T2 and not disease. Because if he knows that the patient will develop or is sensitive to chemoradiation therapy and will develop a complete clinical response and potentially avoid an operation, he would do so, chemoradiation therapy. However, if he knows in advance that this patient will not respond completely to chemoradiation therapy, he probably will go straight to radical surgery without the need for chemoradiation therapy at all. So total mesorectal excision. This is still a main challenge for us colorectal surgeons and in, it happens in many other solid tumors in surgeons. So by taking a simple biopsy, many studies have attempted to look for gene expression profiles to make sure or to understand whether a tumor was going to respond or not to chemoradiation therapy. And many, many of these gene signatures have been published. And one of the disturbing facts is 
there's very little overlap between the genes, between each of these gene signatures. We currently have about 15 studies, 17 gene signatures, a thousand genes being reported, and surprisingly, less than 2% of gene overlap. So perhaps we have to look not for completely unrelated, functionally speaking, of the genes. Instead, we may have to look to specific genetic pathways. Particularly if we talk about chemoradiation therapy, it makes a lot of sense to look for the DNA repair pathway. And then when we look for genes in this particular pathway, we ourselves have been looking to this. And by looking at these specific differentially expressed genes in the DNA pathway, repair pathway, we came up with a score. And the score incorporates upregulated genes and downregulated genes with a single score, with a single objective number, with the intention to help surgeons to decide. As you can see here, the scores are pretty much different between good responders and bad responders. We actually tested this, and you can see the rock curves with a very good area under the curve. And we tested this in an independent sample size in different institutions in the United States. And you can see the results are pretty robust. And there's still very significant differences between patients that respond poorly and those who don't. Again, pretty good area under the curve. So maybe the surgeon will be able to understand with the help of technology an additional tool or additional tools that may help him decide whether the patient should receive chemo radiation therapy and probably develop a complete clinical response. But then there will be a second question, whether is this really a complete response? Does this patient, can he or she avoid really radical surgery? Are we sure there's no cancer there? because we're still relying on rather subjective data in terms of tactile information, endoscopy, radiology. This is all subjective, isn't it? So I think that the, the, the future, the surgeon of the future will be able to take, again, information from these pretreatment biopsies, sequence the actual tumor, and actually look for individual tumor-specific and patient-specific chromosomal rearrangements to look for circulating tumor DNA. And then by looking at these CT DNAs, we expect that patients who develop a complete clinical response will have no circulating tumor DNAs, whereas patients with incomplete response will have still circulating tumor DNAs. And this is exactly what we found. You can see here a patient who underwent chemoradiation therapy and the middle the middle line is the line for the CT DNA. As you can see, it was positive at the moment of biopsy. It was positive at the moment of initiation of chemoradiation therapy. But six weeks after chemoradiation, it was completely zero, and it remained that way thereafter. And this patient developed a complete pathological response. So at the end of the day, I think that the surgeon of the future will have to incorporate technological information from molecular biology that will help him decide the exact technical procedure that he has to perform. It's not really all about technology itself, because technology doesn't make a bad surgeon a good surgeon. Ultimately, a fool with a tool is still a fool. And I'm sure I could never paint like Picasso, even if I used a robot. Instead, Technology will probably will have to be used in the setting of very critical thinking. And for that, we will have to use a very, very, very unique instrument, our brains. Thank you very much.